I work at um, this department called the Urban Institute and I'm also visiting faculty at Azim Premji University in Bangalore. Uh, and um, I mean, the reason I thought we could do something like a virtual tour here was um, following on Mira's excellent book on Bangalore, where we do have a chapter in which does exactly this. It's like a guidebook that will take you around the same locality. And we thought maybe, you know, it might be nice to take you all in the absence of a physical uh, walk that we could have organized thanks to the lockdown and um, and the troubles that the world is facing right now. Um, we thought we could, we could do this virtually. So um, what I will... Uh, in the process, I'll also talk to you a little bit about the history and the kinds of uh, changes that have shaped this place. What I'm essentially going to talk about is the transformation of uh, this uh, Sampangi Lake into the Sri Kantirava Stadium. Uh, and also the area around it and what really remains of the past and what we can actually see uh, today as we walk around that area. So if you think of Sampangi Lake, some, uh, uh, if, I mean, those of you who are familiar with the history of Bangalore would uh, know that colonial Bangalore and that's where a lot of my focus is colonial to modern um, histories um, and what uh, Bangalore used to look like in the colonial period which is uh, say about 1865 onwards was uh, that it was divided into two zones uh, the city and the cantonment and uh, the city was the Pete so all your uh, you know uh, Chik Pete uh, Nagarat Pete and all of those Pete's were part of the city which was collectively called the Pete. It was an agricultural industrial hub of the city, uh, Bale Pete and so on. And then you had the cantonment region which was uh, the more anglicized part of Bangalore. Uh, there was uh, some sort of a boundary that divided both of them and Sampangi Lake which is our lake of interest was banged in the middle of it. Now this was quite interesting because now both <laughs> on the cantonment now, the city and the cantonment both had stakes in who used the water from the lake and how it was appropriated and so on. Uh, Bangalore also has had something called dual jurisdiction. Of course, it was divided into the city and the cantonment um, and headed right at the very top by the British government. But at the same time, the native Wodeir um, rulers of Mysore also had some stakes in the management of the city part of Bangalore. What that meant was there was a lot of tension and tussle between these two various groups to, you know, appropriate and have control over the water and, and may, played out quite interestingly in the landscape. If you look at old pictures of uh, how Sampangi Lake used to look like, that's what it used to look like. Um, today it is transformed into this. Um, I mean, if you can see my cursor, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, but uh, if you look at it, you would find uh, just this little square of water body that remains um, in in uh, memory of what was once a pretty big lake. So let's, uh, usually when we begin a walk uh, around this area, I usually start at the Kantirava Stadium itself, um, usually at the Konark restaurant there. Um, so, oh, um, someone is drawing on my screen now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. But uh, essentially what you're seeing on your screen is the Kantirwa Stadium. Uh, and uh, if you look at the history of... Oh, this is strange. I have got squiggles all over my screen. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's not on my PowerPoint system, so I'm not able to remove it. I'm not sure who's... And I can see pink lines popping up now. Uh -oh. And someone removed it. Is it still clear? Can I just continue? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, you can see? All right. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So if you look at the landscape, uh, that is the Sanpangi Stadium before uh, 1900. Uh, you would see that the center of the lake was this beautiful little, uh, you know, I mean, it was this uh, water body, a massive water body, which had a lot of uh, greenery around it, some open space, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, kacha paths around it and so on. So very few constructions and so on. When you look at the archival documents of the period, oh, yeah. When we look at the archival documents of the period, we are uh, we used we see some very interesting things that happen. 
The first is that the state had prohibited before 1900, which is in the colonial period, no sinking of wells except in terms of scarcity. And also they prohibited excavation for bricks uh, in the same, uh, in the same uh, period. Now this was done not really because of uh, any specific reason, but the fact that they wanted to improve the aesthetics and beauty of the landscape. Then the constructions around the lake were prohibited also for similar reasons. The state started assuming complete responsibility in managing the lakes and they started looking at uh, options that uh, wait no yeah and the state started looking at options that uh, were you know really looking at uh, uh, ways in which we could get water from outside of the city uh, because Bangalore as such was provided with water from uh, from the city since uh, you know the the sixth century CE from by the lakes of Bangalore. I'm so sorry, and these squiggles are a little confusing. Anyway, um, but Bangalore started receiving water from uh, outside the city from about the middle of uh, from about 1930, 19, uh, no, 1890s, 1890s or so. Um, and at that point of time, these lakes within the city began to be seen as uh, either places where we could have you know, some amount of, ah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so uh, lakes within the city began to be seen as spaces where we could, you know, uh, either dump our sewage or garbage and so on, but also places where which, which we could appreciate for their beauty and aesthetics. And in the case of Sampangi Lake, given that it was so close to both the cantonment and the Pete, the focus was really on the beauty and the aesthetics of the landscape. So now we also try to talk to a, a few people about how, Wow. Okay, now I can't, I can't change the slide. I am an, am I given control over this? I'm not, okay, yeah, there I am. No, I'm not. No. I have not got control over my cursor at all in the first place. Is something happening around there? One second. Hey, Mira, she can't uh, control her screen. Sorry, guys, for the technical issues. We are all struggling with these Not up. bits of software. Um, Ma'am, if you can stop sharing and then start sharing again, that um, might work. Yeah, the problem is I'm not able to even do that. Uh, no, I'm just, all I'm able to do is mark crosses on my screen right now. I am not even able to escape the screen, so. Hi, Mira. Come 
out and try again and so the things are not able to the computer uh the things i'm not able to get to that point itself it's not allowing me oh wait yeah it might be able to uh yeah sharing is paused and oh apparently people are saying i can leave and rejoin and that usually works so maybe can i do that yeah yeah sorry sir mm, no nope. i can see it but no um maybe um, i think you'll have to stop annotating and then click on your mouse cursor and then start to move around no it's not stopping the annotating clear all drawings mouse close yeah there we go <laughs> thank you thank you yeah sorry guys so uh like i said the focus was on the beauty and the aesthetics of the landscape and not so much on anything else that might be uh, responsible that might be provided by the lake for example the water to farmers or fishermen and so on um and this we found very clearly when we tried speaking to people who have descended from uh, those communities that used to live around the lake there is still a bunch of people who live there who uh have stories to tell of their grandparents or their parents and so on about how this lake used to look like and what they used to Alara, who uh, was a design student at that point of time, um, and according to them, so if you look at the map or uh, the original map, there were a lot of open spaces, um, and this was digitized from an 1867, 1860s map of Bangalore, which is to be found in the Mythic Society. Now that was uh, created. like and as such it wouldn't have every single detail that people remember about the landscapes and so when we talk to people that's that's what comes out so what they told us was in this whole area where the temple tanks were and so on uh, i mean in this whole open open space that people were talking of in the maps there were a lot of temple tanks your kalyanis that were there um, that would provide water uh, but also you know uh, allow for religious ceremonies to be held the rent horticultural there were a couple of villages around there um, one of them was called sampige halli um, from what people recollect uh, which is also uh during uh, i mean lakes in bangalore were seasonal right so when the water levels in the lake went down it was open wells that would provide secondary uh, sources of water for these people for various purposes there were a few buildings of course and uh and the lake itself was revered uh, there were a lot of festivals around the lake uh, and i shall explain some of them in detail later so between 1900 and 1930 itself um now if you look at that part of bang formalized really um, and a lot more connectivity in the form of roads were seen if you look at the archival records from this period of time uh, what strikes us the most the, the first thing that strikes us is that what lakes from in bangalore pretty much were not used for drinking water anymore they were rather seen as disease vectors because this was also the time that bangalore was uh, grappling with a series of epidemics and pandemics and so on plague cholera malaria Uh, a lot of those things uh, they were also starting to be concerned about lantana which is uh, an invasive plant that you would find around uh, the lakes of bangalore uh, and, and generally in and around the surroundings of bangalore so a lot of these things uh, made and and the fact that there was no dependency anymore on the lakes people started getting water into the comfort of their homes uh, that lakes began to be seen as disease vectors but at the same time there were horticulturists there who were practicing their craft and uh they filed petitions which said that they are not getting enough water simply because a uh, a lot of water from this lake was being diverted into other lakes but also uh there was another side to this whole thing remember i told you that the lake was on the side of the cantonment as well and there people were very afraid that the rising waters of the lake would flood their bungalows or breweries and so on 
and they had also petitioned to sort of uh, decrease the level of water in the lake so that they can live without fear of flooding. Um, there were also portions of the lake that were drained because polo players wanted uh, a space, the Queen's polo players wanted a space to play polo and hey, there was no other better place in Bangalore than this to uh, drain and you know, make a polo ground. But essentially, as a result of all of these conflicts, which went on over several years, there was a decision that was taken in about uh, the 1930s to drain the portion of a lake bed um, and, and make it into a playground. Uh, at this point of time, the people around there told us that there was a lot of influx of people into the landscape because uh, it was a nice place for uh, horticulture and so on. But at the same time, the government, the British government started imposing restrictions on who could and who couldn't enter the lake. Now, this is quite similar to what we do here, right? Uh, you cannot enter a lake after nine o'clock in the morning or so on. Uh, you can only use a lake for certain purposes, which is also what these people had to go through. Uh, they were, they, they, they uh, actually recall this whole, uh, you know, pageantry of uh, liberated guards walking the lake, trying to chase away anyone who was not conforming to their ideals of who could use a lake and so on. Um, therefore, fishing was prohibited. Uh, but at the same time, cultural rituals were permitted. So there was something called the Gange Puja, which was held around the lake every time. So when the lake overflowed, or, you know, the lakes in Bangalore are interconnected, right, across, a, across an elevation gradient. So when the lake overflowed and, and uh, made use of the channels to go into the next in the network, that was a cause for celebration because it meant that the rains had come and the place was bountiful and the harvest was uh, likely to be good. Um, and so at that point of time, uh, what they would do was they would take numerous lit lamps and, and let it into the water body uh, and also accompany it with a sacrifice and so on. But at the same time, some of the dependencies that they had built around these lakes were slowly getting cut off. So as a mark of rebellion, uh, so these, the people remember this as a mark of rebellion because fishing was stopped or prohibited in the lake. They would actually go and, you know, harvest the fish in the dead of the night and then just chuck the fish all over their fields. Um, apparently that was fish manure for them in those days. Um, so there's some of these interesting anecdotes that come in and a lot of that open land was now uh, coconut farms as well as uh, orchards, which uh, had changed over time. So that's what the people told us about that landscape. Now, uh, between 1935 and 1973, if you look at it, um, whatever remained of the water body has also been built over and leaving just this little, you know, square of water body that today you know as a Kandirava lake. Um, and that's where we we'll eventually go in our work today. Um, again, there were, I mean, once the lake was drained, there were a lot of activities that were held. There was a carnival ground on the lake bed. Uh, the... the uh, School Olympics were held before the All India Olympics were conducted in the uh, in a stadium, and the stadium was built because in Mysore there was something similar where a lake was drained into uh, a stadium and converted into a stadium, and that model was emulated in uh, Bangalore as well, and that's how the Sampangi Lake became uh, the Kantirwa Stadium. And in 1945, um, uh, they had the Karnataka State Olympics or something, and then 1947 or just after independence, they conducted the All India Olympics, which in the new stadium. And since then, it has been, uh, and since then it has been a, a aesthetic and recreational space. Now, what you actually see is the predominance of that aesthetic and recreational trope that keeps going on uh, and on around the place. And missing in all of that were the farmers and the cattle owners and so on. And that's something that we keep seeing even today when you think of lakes in Bangalore. Uh, which is exactly what I said. And the people then recall that people started migrating away from the landscape. There were a lot of uh, fights as to who owned land and how much compensation you could get and so on. Um, the lake, I mean, there was still some water. I mean, when you drain a water body, it's, not, it's unlikely that it's going to become a dry land uh, overnight, right? So uh, there was still some water there. There was still some dampness and that was like a polluted cesspit. Uh, there was a slum nearby and people used to use that dirty water now to wash their vessels and graze their cattle and, and so on. A few wells still existed, but that was the extent uh, to which this, this landscape uh, changed over time. Today, obviously, you do not have anyone, you know, migrating into the landscape, um, at, apart from, you know, uh, the more urban ones. No agriculture, no horticulture, no grazing of lamps, no uh, Gange Puja, nothing that actually reminds you of the lakes that floods uh, 
every year, twice a year, every monsoon, uh, and and big pumps draining out the water from the lake. So that that's the story of how this lake uh, existed. Uh, so really now, what remains of the past? So let's go back to this this picture, which was the lake as it looked like in 1885. Um, this part where the greenery is, this thing probably. Uh, I mean, that part is what is Kasturba Road today. Then you have the Vittel Malia Road here and St. Joseph's and so on. And then you have the Raja. Hello. Hello. Yeah, no, and then I joined. No, now I'm joined back. Yeah. Share screen. Can you share the screen, Hita? Doing that. Yeah. Hmm. Can you see see it now? Yeah. Right. So uh, we normally walk down uh, Vittel Malia Road, and when you look on the side of the stadium itself, you would find remains of the old Kaluve that uh, used to carry water across the lake. Um, so uh, when you walk down to the end of the road, that's what you see: some remains of the old pipes. Uh, if I mean, if you look further, but what you also see is that it still functions as a Kaluve of some sort, uh, even today. Uh, when you go a little further, I mean, on the other side of the road, you have the St. Joseph's Indian High School uh, that was built according to its website by draining the wetlands of the Sampangi Lake um, and in the 1800s sometime. Um, and also rem a remainder of what the transformation of the landscape looks like. But then what's interesting is you walk further along or along Vittil Malia Road and then you get the Malia Hospital uh, on, on your left. Then you also get the ITC Gardenia, which is a luxury hotel, um, on also on the on the left of the road. Um, in between all of that is this little nondescript place that uh, I have marked here as a red dot, and that is a uh, that's that's quite interesting because it's a little temple called the Sri Bireshwara Temple, and it's very easy to miss this little arch that you would see on that road, uh, you know, when you when you walk by that place, uh, and. I mean, walk in there, and this is what greets you. A uh, number of trees, a temple, an Ashwatkate, and so on. Um, a lot of bonnet macaques playing about, and so on. Uh, this place is very interesting because, of course, this is the Ashwatkate that I was talking about. Lots of trees. It's like stepping into another part of Bangalore in the heart of Bangalore. Uh, but what's most interesting is the little temple that is uh, at the far end of this compound. Um, it is a Kuruba. Uh, it's a temple belonging to the Kuruba community who were shepherds. And uh, at the base of the temple, you can see that there are several stone um, carved things there uh, that form the base of it. And there's a close up of that. Uh, and essentially, these, uh, from what I have read, these are undated uh, as yet, but they also talk about, uh, but, they, but they represent the practice of sati that was held long ago in this landscape. According to the temple, these were um, these were remains or, or these were relics left behind by people who came from long distances in their community to perform rituals, and then and then they just left the stone as a memory as a memory of their their activities and then went back. Um, what we've read and uh, I think there was a very nice article in Deccan Herald by Dr. S. K. Aruni um, about this, which um, refers to these as sati stones. Um, I don't think anything in the picture tells you that, but um, but certain motives that were carved on these stones actually talk about uh, the practice of sati that was held in this place, which give you a little bit of goosebumps when you actually think about it uh, today. Uh, so then we move from there uh, and we walk towards the Raja Ram Mohan Roy Road. So you cross the road from, from uh, the corner at Malia Hospital. 
and then you come across this little space where you you know there are the steps cut into the uh, onto the road and you go down uh, on one side on the right you have the 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 raja ram mohan roy road but this little gully towards the side is what uh, is interesting now according to the locals there they remember this place as where water was let in so so the lakes in bangalore were mostly agrarian right and uh, there was a system wherein water was uh, appropriated from the lake so upstream of the lake where water would flow in you had all these water uh, you know crops that didn't need as much water millets and green leafy vegetables and so on and downstream of the lake wherever water would flow down in abundance was where the paddy farms were and apparently this place was where water would be directed into the paddy farms and uh, you know uh, used for cultivation uh, according to the vani kulakshatri as a tigila community that lived there uh, today of course this area is densely populated there's also a little slum which um, again locals say have been built on top of a kalyani uh, and therefore is called the kalyani slum um, and it's a nice walk just down there to see another side of bangalore that you've never really seen um, or paid attention to but then when you walk into sampangi ramnagar so we are in sampangi ramnagar and we walk down that little stretch take a left and um, go down uh, you find this government primary school and just next to the government primary school you have this wonderful structure which is what remains of a kalyani or a temple tank and um, again since i am not a period historian i do not know what period of the year it uh, was built in um, i mean meera i think i remember having a discussion with meera say uh, you know where she indicated that we we could think of this as something that looks at the vijayanagar period but uh, meera if you can con- you know confirm that or later on that would be great but essentially this uh, according to the local oral histories that i have conducted was this temple tank that uh, you know served people with water for a very long time and grew into disuse again uh, once a lake kind of fell into disuse um there were a lot of incidents of drowning and so on here and it was spring fed according to them um and what they did was they uh, converted it built it over uh, at least they they sort of um, covered the water and now the temple tank with its in, you know structure is used for various community activities so you find uh, people learning dance and karate and playing cricket and so on you know on that ground on that space but it's also used for very interesting things so during the deepa aradhana time which is the kartika deepa festival that we have here um you find that the community gathers together here sets the place alight uh, in with small lamps and um, and then they conduct cultural programs so in a sense what was a co- ecological commons that provided water to several people really um has now become a cultural commons that is serving a lot of people in different ways and uh, and it was not without struggles so the locals talk about how the the bbnp really wanted to build the structure over just like they did with several other temple tanks in the area and a lot of people actually point on the map and tell you here there was a kalyani and there there was a kalyani and so on uh, but the locals got together and tried to fight for this what they feel is their heritage really and so you have this wonderful structure there in in sampangi ram nagar um, hidden pretty much in plain sight and it's a lovely visit if you do uh, go that way so when you come out uh and then walk back into uh the the vital mal i mean the um, what's it called the rajara mohan roy road and then you uh cross the road at the junction and uh, enter you know the premises of the sampangi lake itself what you see is this this little temple here which belongs to the 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 vani kula kshatriya community or the tigila community of bangalore now this is where the oldest festival of bangalore i think it was just a few days ago uh, on ugadi day i think uh, the, the first pavarnami of the ugadi i think that's when it celebrated the karaga of bangalore and uh, this is where the procession really ho- you know sort of initiates and picks up a lot of steam um, and this is the reason why we still have a small water body there which is called the the sampangi lake so this little temple was built uh, you know much after independence with a lot of struggle by the community um, as a place where they you know they could sort of um, host their event uh, and also you know a place where they where they uh, worship but if you go further in 
uh, from this temple down there towards the stadium, you come across what remains of the lake, which is the small rectangular water body that for the most part um, is in a state of dryness or, you know, with little water in it, but is filled up every year during the Karaga for the Karaga festivities. Now, uh, there are several reason, stories as to why this, this particular, uh, you know, a uh, bit of water body exists when the entire lake was drained and converted into a stadium. So uh, one of the things is that, um, I mean, and they're not probably mutually exclusive either. So one of the things is that this is the site where the oldest festival of Bangalore is held and therefore it has to be a site of heritage and so on. And uh, the second was uh, in 1984, there was this committee called the Lakshman Rao Committee, um, which did the survey of the lakes of Bangalore and cre created what is now known quite famously as the Lakshman Rao Committee Report. And in that, there is this little thing which says that, you know, you need a name for a lake that has so much history behind it. Um, and I think uh, that, was, that was the reason to keep this little bit of water body for the community that uses it. The story of the Karaga is also very interesting here. Um, when you talk to the people uh, who celebrate it, they tell you that, um, I mean, so the traditional story of the Mahabharata is that you had the five Pandavas who married Draupadi and, you know, they fought, they won the battle um, with the Kauravas. And then, uh, you know, they ascend one, uh, you know, in a line to heaven where, uh, you know, Yudhishthira comes first and the last is Draupadi. And then uh, as they near heaven, you know, Draupadi falls off, followed by Nakul, Sahadev and, and so on in increasing order of uh, age. Until the only person who actually reaches heaven is Yudhishthira because he's um, Dharmaraya. Now, uh, the story of the Karaga begins at that point where Draupadi falls um, tired. And the community believes that at that point of time, she was uh, really tired. She fell down. Uh, she was still really pretty and therefore attracted the lusty eyes of some demon. Um, and so, um, you know, she cried because she felt helpless and she didn't know how to defend herself. And from her tears and her sweat, uh, the community of Vanikula uh, Kshatriyas or the Tigilas, you know, came forth. Um, they, they destroyed the demon and then they found themselves without purpose because their mother was, you know, going to follow her husband into heaven. And so at that point of time, they asked her what they should, what he, they should what's their purpose on, on, on the planet and so on. And, and at that point of time, Draupadi told them that, uh, once a year for the period of the Karaga, she's going to manifest herself within the community, um, you know, and, uh, you know, see that her children are doing all right. And so the Karaga is really a celebration of Draupadi manifesting herself within the community um, for that annual period. Um, and which is why you have a lot of those festivities. And in fact, um, and I'm not sure how... Um, True this is, but uh, one of the priests at the Dharmaraya Swami temple told us that uh, what it celebrates is the different stages of uh, Draupadi's life. So in Kaban Park, they do the puja where, I mean, I'll show you that bit as well, um, where, you know, they do the ablutions and things before before uh, bringing the Hasikaraga to this particular tank. And it's apparently at this tank that Draupadi comes forth as a child and they celebrate her stages of life through the uh, several days that Karaga is held usually. Um, so that's, uh, that's what this lake holds. But it's also very interesting when you go there on random days that are not Karaga days, you find some very interesting things that happen, uh, some nice stories that you hear. Um, for, for a small body of lake, I think it's really nice to see this uh, vibrancy around it still. Um, on one occasion we go and there we find another member of the Tigla community uh, feeding fish so they cultivate fish on, on this, on this um, uh, water body and then uh, they harvest it. But then they also feed a, a group of circling Brahmini kites overhead before actually taking the catch to their home. And it's a practice that they've been following uh, since that person's father's days, which is also very interesting because you don't really think of, you know, such a small space being able to foster so many relationships. Another day I went, um, I was shown to the, the far end of this water body. And uh, there they have built, so the island there has got, uh, I mean, the tank is divided there as a pathway to the island. And there is this local legend here which says that that's where a snake rested. And so you have a community there that worships 
uh, the movement of that snake and where it rested through a shivlinga place in the island. And so these are little things that you keep finding when you keep going back to this place that, I don't know, uh, is, uh, fosters a sense of heritage, a sense of community, a sense of cohesion, a sense of ecology really um, around this place. Um, the rest of that area is what we call the Sampangi Tank Park. Uh, not very well used, not, not much footfall, um, not used much as a park at all, but you have this little board there which tells you that it is Sampangi Tank Park. And that's pretty much the condition of the Sampangi Tank Park. You can also see the water of the Sampangi Lake um, uh, in the far uh, top right of, or, of, this, of the screen. So then we move from Sampangi Tank and move into Kabun Park. So you come out of Sampangi Tank and you cross the road and you have um, the, you know, the this, uh, this Kabun Park there. You enter Kabun Park and you, I mean, most people who've gone into Kabun Park would have seen this little structure there in Ashwat Kate where a lot of people offer, uh, you know, uh, of make offerings to the, uh, to the gods they believe in and uh, I mean, it's a lovely place. There are lots of pigeons and so on. But walk a little further into the park from here and you come across this older structure. So you can see the more, more used structure in the background of this picture. And then you can see this little tree there with a lot of stone carvings um, in, the, in the foreground of the picture. Uh, this particular, and, and what's interesting about this, and here's a close up. What's interesting about this is that these carvings, again, I think I remember having a discussion with someone when leading one of these walks in, in uh, foreign tech, that some of these, again, represent the Vijayanagar era, but I have, I have really no uh, clue when these were built. What's interesting really to me is that you can see that the age uh, of these stones, but the fact that the tree is growing over them, really. Um, now, this place is also very interesting because um, every year, uh, they celebrate the Kamadeva Purnima on this Ashwat Kate. Uh, but also, um, one of the older photographs of Bangalore shows a lot of people washing clothes at the banks of the lake and a tree in the background. This is that particular tree, which kind of tells you that this was a boundary of the lake that we were talking about. So even you walk further in, um, and then further into the park and, and a red dot is here now. Um, and what you see after crossing some bamboo groves is this little structure that is enclosed. Uh, looks like a pond, but usually doesn't have water. Again, during the Karaga time, this uh, area is filled with water. This, this little structure here is filled with water. And when you look at the entrance of it, what it tells you uh, in Kannada there is Karaga the Kunte Shakti Pita. Now this is where the Karaga actually starts. Uh, in Bangalore. Um, this is where the ablutions are offered and during the Karaga period this entire structure gets filled with water and uh, it's really a lovely sight. Calling back again to the fact that there is a lot of history around the water uh, water heritage of Bangalore. Um, and a lot of things, these things remain in plain sight but are often not, you know, remembered really until either the Karaga happens or when you know the Kantiriva Stadium floods, and then we say, "Hey, look! We've, this is what comes about of building a stadium on a lake." Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of these relics of the past, a lot of things that people remember around the lake that uh, come to the fore when you actually engage with the landscape. And I think that's that's what is really important uh, to engage with around these places. So you have the Karagada Kunte Shakti Pita. You also have a number of wells around these uh, areas, which. Uh, which um, uh, Vishwanath and Bayom have recently revived and recharged. So uh, that's also a lovely site to visit. So then you have, that's, that's another view of this um, Karagata Kunte. And with that, you come out of uh, the walk and maybe chai and masal dosa at Konak restaurant. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you, Hita. That was really, really good. Um, yeah, the pitches, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh. yeah. <Okay>. Oh. <laughs> Somebody's hungry. So, <laughs> we'll take questions. Uh, Geetika, I think you had a question earlier in the, you had asked, you typed something. Uh, Geetika, do you want to ask your question? Sure. No, I was just, uh, I was just interested in, in the maps that Hita showed and uh, just wanted to check if those are available online because um, in fact, I'm, I'm doing some research on 
uh, you know, around maps and living spaces. So um, just wanted to check if these maps are available anywhere online. Um, so these maps are not available online. So what we did was really digitize a lot of the maps that, um, um, you know, were existing in various places. So the 1865 map was from uh, 1856, 1865. Uh, oh, no, sorry, it's 1887. I've, I've made these maps some years ago, and then I haven't you know, gone back to the actual date, but it's 1887. And this map was uh, is present as a hand-drawn map that has been folded several times over at the Mythic Society in Bangalore. Um, and you can go take pictures of it and then mosaic it using a GIS platform, which is what we did. So there is some shift, obviously, that you will see when you're working with these maps. But uh, I think with all that, that's the best you can get. Then for 1935, we used a map that was that is present at the Indian Institute of World Culture. Okay. Uh, that uh, they have that map, and then 1973, you need to go into Survey of India at Kormangla um, and ask them for their uh, one is to twenty five thousand Survey of India topo sheets, scale topo sheets, which hopefully they will allow you to go and you know scan and digitize and then put it on the GIS platform. So yeah, that's how this work was done. Sure. Uh, Thank Geetika. you so much, Eta. I really love this work. I mean, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Uh, Geetika, actually, uh, some of these maps are also available at the Intac office. We do have printouts of them. You're welcome to, uh, uh, you're welcome to come and actually uh, come to our office anytime and take a look as well when the lockdown sure. lifts. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, sure. I'll connect with you on mail if that's okay. I'm in London right now, but I'll connect with you on okay. mail. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, if okay. you're in London, uh, well, Geetika, if you're in London, the British Library is a brilliant source of maps. Okay, great. That's yeah. thank you. In the office of the British Library. You can get some for oh. it too. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll I'll be happy to let me know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deepa, you had a question, no? Deepa. Deepa Mohan. Oh. Mm, okay. Okay, anybody else who has a question? Someone wants to know if they will have a real work after the lo lockdown is lifted. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to organize one. It depends on you also, Hita. I know, yeah. I'm here <laughs> in November, so I'm quite happy to do it. Hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, somebody wants to know, but Geeta Suresh has asked a question. No? Can you uh, talk about those two villages? They were talking about the villages. One is uh, that Sampige early and the other one, I think that time was the video got frozen and we couldn't. But still those villages are existing. Um, well, not so much in formal names, but a lot of people still remember that area is Sampige uh, The area is formerly called Sampangi Ram Nagar. And uh, again, there are some very interesting stories about why um, the name Sampige uh, originated. So there are two versions that I've heard. Um, one is uh, the fact that it was named after a daughter-in-law of Kempe Gauda, Sampangi Emma. Uh, but the other one is more ecological and uh, slightly more romantic, I guess. Um, so the temple, the Bireshura temple priests have this oral tradition going on um, where they do not have any written records, but a lot of their history is passed down from generation to generation that way. Um, and uh, what they tell you is that there was this um, tree there that grew on the other side of Sampangi Lake and whose roots ex extended all the way up to the point where the Bhagavad Temple is today. Uh, and that was the Samp Sampige tree and therefore Sampige Halipad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, really, we had a great work. Thank you. Um, Hita, uh, Deepa had a question saying, where's the water uh, brought from to fill the Kunte? I'm not sure. I'm hmm. assuming some tanker or something, or maybe maybe biomes work, biome once it's recharged the wells, maybe. I'm, I'm not really sure where the water comes in. Also, the community doesn't tell you a lot of things when you talk to them, really, if you're an outsider. So this whole thing about it being, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, the story of Draupadi's life from birth to, you know, uh, when when the Vanikula Kshatriyas were, were born. Mm -hmm. Also was something that um, came to me by accident 
um, at, from a priest at the temple. Um, and then when I try to ask it with, ask the same thing uh, uh, with a person, uh, with one of the more lead, uh, you know, prominent people within the community, they told me that certain things are not mentioned, uh, are not supposed to be told to people who are from outside. Mm. So, so yeah, mm. I mean, it's, it's nice to get some of these things. And if anyone has any information of where water comes in from these things, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask. Um, Hari Krishnan. Yeah. Yeah, the screen of the computer. Yeah. Do you want to ask a question or should I? Okay, uh, Hari Krishnan has asked. I mean, you can see it on chat now. I'd like to know what kind of boundary existed between the city and the camp. Ha. So, Meera, I think I should ask you that. Was there any physical boundary? <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no physical boundary, but uh, no, there were I mean, no physical maps. I'm sorry? So there, were, there were lines that demarcated it in the maps, which is how yeah. we got our boundaries. Correct. But so, I there, were, there were these pillars, there were these so-called station boundary pillars, which existed. Uh, I forget the exact number now, but uh, there were these pillars which had a number on them in Roman numbers, so 1 to 27 or some such thing, uh, which demarcated the cantonment from the, or the civil and military from the other, uh, from the uh, Pete area. But uh, otherwise, there was, it's not like there was a physical fence as such. Uh, except a lot of you would have heard that there was a toll gate and all. There were actually quite a few, but that is uh, that is actually more for people carrying goods from one, from one end of the city to the other. So like if you're going from the Maharaja administered part of the city, if you were going into the Kant or civil and military station, then you would have to pay a toll on those goods. So, but otherwise there were no uh, physical boundaries as such. People could actually walk across. And uh, Deepa says, are any of the pillars surviving? No, none. Okay. Uh, you, you showed us two temples. Um, you're not very audible. Uh, uh, the deity in the temples, two temples. Yeah. Uh, you showed us two temples. Yeah. Uh, what, what are the deities there in the temple? Um, in the Bireshura temple, it is a, a manifestation of Shiva, which the, which the Kurubas worship. Uh, he's called Bireshura itself. Um, the Kurubas, huh, they worship Dharmaraya Swami. I see. Not the Kurubas, what am I saying? The Vani Kula Kshatriya, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, their, their prominent temple is the Dharmaraya Swami temple, right? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's where the Karga starts, I thought. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, that's where it starts out, then goes off into the Kavan Park and so on. Uh. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. In that case, uh, Hita, thank you so much. Uh, can we can we see you again, Hita? You're still sharing your screen. Um. Yeah. Uh, stop sharing. Where do I go now? Let's see. Stop sharing. Great. Okay. So thank you so much, Hita. And <laughs> that was really wonderful. And, thank you. Um, Thanks for putting up with all the glitches that we had in the middle, but. Yeah. So um, for those of you who missed part of it, uh, we are recording this and we will put it up on uh, Intact's YouTube channel. So it will be accessible later. Yeah. Huh, okay, so all great. these are going to come up on screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Hita. Oh.